welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to a Charles Carroll uh, program event. Um, but I also want first to graciously acknowledge uh, the uh, generous support also of the political science department and the Peace and Conflict Studies concentration. Uh, unfortunately, we inadvertently left Peace and Conflict Studies off the poster, so I apologize for that. Um, let me just, I'm going to say just a brief word about the Charles Carroll program. I always feel I have to reintroduce students uh, to the Charles Carroll program because it might be the first event that you attended. But Charles Carroll program has been on campus for five or six years now. It's named after Charles Carroll, who was the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. And one of the missions of the program has been to bring a variety of speakers to campus uh, who represent diverse views to, to uh, enrich the intellectual life here. Um, and uh, so I, I just want to call your attention to a couple other events that are going to be occurring this year. Uh, a week from now, actually, uh, next Thursday, um, Judge Richard Leon will be speaking at 5 p.m. here in the Green Library. Uh, he's Holy Cross class of 1971, and he's a senior uh, district court judge for the District uh, Court of Columbia. Uh, and, and if you know anything about the judicial system, by the way, the D.C. Circuit is the most interesting of all the circuit courts because it receives a, it deals with a lot of, of very important cases involving government as an actor, federal government as an actor. So uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, attend that event. And uh, just let you know that Later this spring, we're going to have a major conference, uh, I think April 12th and 13th, on the administrative state. Um, so you'll hear a lot more about that as we get closer to the event. Our uh, speaker today is Professor Elliot Cohen from the uh, Slice Institute. And uh, here to introduce him is Professor Ward Thomas. Thank you. I was very excited to learn that uh, Dr. Cohen would be coming here to speak at Holy Cross because he's a former professor of mine um, and uh, one of my favorites. I took several courses with him. I did a field exam with him. Uh, and his courses were tremendous. He was always extremely generous uh, and helpful. And uh, I think all of us in college and university teaching have professors that uh, make particular uh, impression on us and we learn lessons from that we try to apply in the classroom. But today I want to briefly mention one important lesson I did not learn from Professor Cohen. Um, because one time, one thing I, I sometimes say to younger colleagues, uh, if they ask, well, what happens if the student asks you a question and you don't know the answer? And I usually say something, well, own up, because you'll be found out, it'll be transparent, and, and try to uh, make a learning experience out of it. Uh, well, I didn't learn this from Professor Cohen, simply because I never, ever heard anyone ask him a question that he did not know the answer to. Any question, any subject. Uh, I was utterly amazed by the depth of the knowledge uh, that, that he brought. Um, and remembering this, I pulled out my old notebooks from the court. This, this is the real thing. Uh, and it, spent a little time reviewing them the last couple of days. Um, and now here are a few of the things that he talked about intelligently and in detail, just in one course over a few weeks, uh, and just in response to students' questions, which I assume he did not plan uh, ahead of time. Um, just a handful, General Ulysses S. Grant's use of maneuver in the Vicksburg campaign. Underrated, I remember you said. Uh, the geometry of the decks of British aircraft carriers in the years between World War I and World War II. Uh, rates of venereal disease among U.S. troops in the punitive expedition in Mexico, 1916-1917. How the work of military theorist Karl von Clausewitz in the early 19th century anticipated the insights of chaos theory that was developed in the late 20th century. Um, one of my favorites, the impact of the agricultural revolution of the 18th century, and specifically the agronomy of the potato, on Napoleon's Peninsular War in Spain, and therefore on the rise of guerrilla warfare in Europe. Um, I could have, I could go on and on and on. Um, it, it was really remarkable. And after a few minutes of going through the notebooks, though, I, what started to strike me as most remarkable was not just Professor Cohen's voluminous knowledge is staggering. Uh, 
uh, as it was and is, but the quality of the insights that he provided in every single lecture, con uh, connections between apparently unrelated things, parallels between very different time periods, um, thoughts about trends and what we may be likely to see in the years ahead, which was especially interesting to look back over since uh, the years ahead at that point have now become the last 20 years and uh, realized that the insight stood up very, very well. Um, and on reflection, I think it was that combination of knowledge and insight, or more to the point, knowledge in the service of insight, that made him such a terrific professor and which also, I should add, make his books so rewarding to read and which make us lucky to have him here today. Uh, so I want to talk a, a little bit about his credentials. He is the Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. After receiving his BA and PhD degrees from Harvard, he taught there and at the Naval War College before going to SICE in 1990. Um, he's the author of many books, including most recently, The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force, uh, which he will be talking about today, as well as Conquered into Liberty, Two Centuries of Battle Along the Great War Path that Made the American Way of War, and Supreme Command, Soldier, Statesman, and Leadership in Wartime. He served in the U.S. Army Reserve. He was director in the Defense Department's Policy Planning Staff led the U.S. Air Force's multi-volume study of the first Gulf War and has served in various official advisory positions. Um, in 2007 to 2009, he was counselor of the Department of State, serving as Secretary Condoleezza Rice's senior advisor, focusing, focusing chiefly on issues of war and peace, including Iraq and Afghanistan. His commentary appears in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and on major television networks, and he is a contributing editor at The Atlantic. Uh, we are delighted to have him here at Holy Cross, share both his knowledge and his insight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elliot. Well, thank you. What do you do about uh, an introduction like that? Uh, except, Ward, since we're colleagues now, I can tell you I was faking it. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be here for a number of reasons, partly to be back with old friends, uh, partly because I'm a native New Englander. Uh, I grew up outside Boston, and uh, Boston still feels like my hometown, even though I, I moved to a, out of, away from New England in 1989. Um, and I'm actually uh, quite happy to be part of the Charles Carroll program. So of course, Charles Carroll was a, Mar was a Marylander, because, as we all know, Maryland was founded uh, to be the colony for Catholics, although the Protestants then took it over. It's kind of standard story, all you Catholics. Uh, the uh, Protestants took it over and actually disenfranchised the Catholics. Um, but uh, towards the end of his life, Carroll, who was really quite a remarkable figure, one of the other things he escorted Benjamin Franklin north on this incredible trip to Montreal in 1775 in the dead of winter. Um, he built a huge mansion called Homewood in, uh, in Baltimore. Well, that mansion ended up being given to Johns Hopkins University, and the core campus of Johns Hopkins University is the Homewood campus. So there's a, there's a tie there. Okay, so the book is The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force. It's not an elegant title, but it's unambiguous. Of course, the title of the big stick comes from uh, Teddy Roosevelt very famously saying, speak softly and carry a big stick. What I find interesting about that is actually that Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he, he was quoting this as a proverb, so it was out there before. What's more interesting to me is the speech in which he said this. Because the speech was entitled National Duties, he gave it when he was still vice president at the Minnesota State Fair on September 3rd, 1901. And I believe very deliberately chose to give that speech in the American heartland. We can be certain of one thing, whether we wish it or not, we cannot avoid hereafter having duties to do in the face of other nations. 
All that we can do is to settle whether we shall perform these duties well or ill. Four days later, President McKinley was shot. Two weeks later, Theodore Roosevelt was president. Now, the United States has always been globally engaged. As I always tell my students, what we call World War II was actually World War VIII, beginning with the Nine Years' War at the end of the 17th century. And the British colonies, and later on the United States of America, got involved in each of those global conflicts. First, a whole series between Britain and France, and then, of course, what we think of as the world wars. The United States was always commercially connected with the rest of the world. Theodore Roosevelt was unusual in that he, I believe, is the first president who saw the United States having an international role to play and not simply being connected to the rest of the world. But since Theodore Roosevelt's time, since that speech, the United States has played a global role, most notably, of course, from 1917 through 1918 and uh, World War I, and then very systematically through World War II and beyond. The price of that has been hundreds and hundreds, trillions of dollars spent on defense, over 600,000 dead, more than twice as many wounded, uh, a military that is 10 times as large as the one over which Theodore Roosevelt presided. Why? Was it worth it then? And more importantly, I think, for us, for you, is, is it going to be worth it in the years to come? I decided I was, uh, I, I write different kinds of books uh, because I have this fear of writing the same book twice. I decided for this book I wanted to write a book about military power and American foreign policy set today. But before that was 17th, 18th, and early 19th century military history. Very different. And there were three reasons I wanted to write about military power and American foreign policy. The first was it seems to me that there was a great debate about American foreign policy that should have happened at the end of the Cold War. Because after all, that global American presence which we take for granted, that military of 1.3 million people that we take for granted, that network of alliances and commitments around the world that we take for granted, is in part an artifact of the world wars, but it's largely a result of the Cold War. And the commitments that we made from 1945 onwards, particularly from 1948 onwards. And you would have thought when the Cold War came to an end, that that would be the time to reconsider, to ask, well, does that still make sense? Does that expenditure of treasure, potentially of blood, of commitment, of political energy still make sense? That debate did not occur. The debate didn't occur because the 1990s were, as my late colleague Fuad Ajmi once put it, the great picnic. Things were good. Dot com, Starbucks in Mongolia, um, the United States fights one sizable war, the first Iraq war. Other people actually pay for it, made a profit on the first Gulf War. We collected so much money. Casualties were, relatively speaking, extremely low, fewer than 150 killed. We lost more people to accidents, actually, than killed in action. Um, being the world's only superpower seemed cheap. The debate did not occur in the 2000s either, and that's not because of the great picnic, but because of the great emergency, because of 9-11 and the wars that followed that. Today, I would argue that debate is in some ways beginning to occur in a kind of incoherent and inchoate way, but it's happening. In a world that I believe is palpably more dangerous, where there's a great deal of uncertainty about what our role in the world should be that has fed a variety of movements. So I, that's one reason to write the book. Second reason I wanted to write the book was because it has often seemed to me that in public discourse there's a artificial dichotomy that's posed between diplomacy on the one hand or force. You prefer a diplomatic solution to a military solution. And in fact, you just saw this very recently with Secretary of State Tillerson talking about diplomacy um, regarding the North Korean situation, and he said, well, diplomacy continues until the first bomb drops. That's profoundly not true. 
Any student of the history of war will tell you absolutely not. As the great German thinker Karl Clausewitz said, it's just it war is a continuation of politics by other means. It's just in some cases it's bullets rather than diplomatic diplomatic notes. But the truth is, diplomacy pervades war as well. And over time, what part of what has happened in our countries, the group of people who think about foreign policy are one group of people, and the group of people who think about defense are another group of people. And they actually don't talk to each other very much, and they're actually different kinds of people. And I wanted to write a book that would bridge that, uh, that would make the connection between military power and foreign policy. And it seems to me that's particularly urgent, because war and the study, serious study of military power and of war is remote for many of us, including many of those who end up in positions of great responsibility. And even people like myself find ourselves training generations of public servants and military officers, but those are not the people making the decisions, although they shape them. And they're not the engaged citizens upon which any republic depends. And so this is a book that's written really for the engaged citizen. The third reason to write the book was that it, it had seemed to me that George W. Bush uh, in whose administration I served, did not expect to be a wartime commander-in-chief. With less excuse, I don't think Barack Obama expected to be or understood himself as a wartime commander-in-chief. I don't claim any expertise about what Donald J. Trump is thinking, uh, but I don't think he thought hard about that one, that he was a wartime commander-in-chief, but that's what they all are. And that's actually what Trump's successor will be. It's not at all clear that any of the three of them had prepared, really, to be a wartime commander in chief, had thought deeply about it, had studied military history, and reflected on what that means. Nor is it clear that many of their advisors have either, to include somebody like Secretary Tillerson. And I think that Tillerson quote it does illustrate how ill prepared many certainly civilian leaders are, to think about military power. As I've reflected on the book since it came out at the beginning of this year, I have actually a final reason that hadn't occurred to me, but um, seems to be a fourth and perhaps the most powerful of all reasons to write this book. And that is that we have lost the living memory of the 1930s. Um, I thought about this when my own mother passed away two years ago. She had grown up in the 1930s, safely here in Boston, but it was very interesting talking about what it was like to be your age and watching parts of the map of Europe be covered with black and watching the newsreels of German troops marching into Paris and hearing about massacres in China. We've lost the living memory of the 1930s. And what that the people who lived through that period had, and I knew a lot of people growing up because it was my parents' generation, they knew that really bad things could happen in the world. That the world order could be seriously deranged. Our understanding of bad is 9-11. And for most of you, I suspect that's not even a memory except when you were quite young. But for people who are a little bit older than you, 9-11 is what bad looks like. 9-11 is not what bad looks like. It's not what really bad looks like. It could be a lot worse. So the core question of the book is, should the United States use military power to maintain a kind of global order, and how should it be? We'll just sum it up somewhere, give you a quick summary of the chapters, and then work my way through some of the arguments uh, over some concluding thoughts, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion. So the, the book is laid out in uh, eight chapters. Uh, much to my surprise, I got a review in the New York Times, and to my much greater surprise, I got a positive review in the New York Times, which I never expected in my life. Uh, it, got, it, gave, it did give me the most curious compliment I've ever gotten, that it reminded the reviewer of a bento box, which I usually associate with raw fish, but uh, this person associated with the book. There are eight chapters. The first is called Why the United States? Why should the United States 
play a global role. Second chapter, 15 years of war, reflecting on our recent experiences of conflict. Third chapter is on the American hand. What, what are the resources that the United States brings to bear on the world? Four chapters of what I take to be the main challenges to which American military power is relevant. Uh, and then a last chapter called The Logic of Hard Power. Let me unpack those pieces a bit. Why the United States? Actually, a number of people in different ways, serious people, have made serious arguments about why the United States does not need to play the kind of role that it played during the Cold War. One advanced by uh, Steven Pinker, a well-known psychologist at, uh, at Harvard, in a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, is, says, actually, war is on the decline. The world is a much nicer place. Despite the stuff you read in the headlines, uh, it's getting to be more and more benign. People don't kill each other as much. There's even less domestic violence, uh, as well as international violence. It's a longer argument, but my response to that is you could have, you could have written that book in 1900, and it would have been just as persuasive, and it would have had almost exactly the same evidence. And in order to to accept that argument, you have to think of the world war as, as blips, and I find myself hard pressed to do that. It's also interesting that the one, Picker gives a number of explanations which are quite interesting for the decline of international violence. He omits one, which is American statecraft. He doesn't actually talk about purpose of action by political leaders, particularly in this country. So I find that problematic. Another school of thought associated with so-called realists and international relations has to do with the balance of power, that there are these sort of automatic mechanisms in this world which will balance out any, um, any rising power. Again, a couple of problems with that. In periods of the past when there have been balance of power systems, they've not been peaceful. Not, whatever you want to call the 18th century and early 19th century, I wouldn't particularly call it a peaceful period. Uh, it under, they underestimate, I think, the role of decisions, personalities, above all, ideology. It's one of my, my beefs with the traditional study of international relations. It treats states like they're billiard balls. But they're not billiard balls. Uh, a Stalin is a Stalin, a Mao is a Mao, and that both leads them to do things and it allows them to use means which are unthinkable for other people. Some people make the case for soft power replacing hard power. And I think there is something to that. The book, the subtitle is The Limits of Soft Power, not The Irrelevance of Soft Power. But there too, I think that argument falls apart. Sometimes soft power is not power. The fact that we all speak English, that's the global language, that's not something you can use. It's just a condition, it's a fact. Sometimes it's not always very nice. Sanctions are not always very nice. The sanctions, sanctions against a country like North Korea or Iran or early on against Iraq fall mainly on the population. They don't really fall on the leadership. It's rather much harder than you might think to target them. And they're not always effective. I am absolutely in favor of bringing lots of foreign students to the United States. But Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the architect of 9-11, got his bachelor's degree in North Carolina. So, in that case, clearly, soft power didn't do what people thought it should do. There's some people who argue that the United States is simply incompetent. The United States can no longer exercise power effectively. Uh, anything that we touch goes sour, uh, and so therefore we shouldn't try. And to which my response is, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. In a case like Colombia, for example, or indeed I would say South Korea, and there are others, actually American military power has been quite effective in contributing to a global war. It is always messy and incomplete, but I would argue it has achieved things. Finally, there's the argument that we have more urgent domestic priorities, what President Obama called nation building at home. The problem with that one is if you look at many of the great expansions of the United States government and of things being effectively done, 
to um, that you might call nation building, whether or not you might have been in favor of them. Everything from the interstate highway system to the civil rights efforts to the transcontinental railroad back in the middle of the 19th century, they've all been done during wartime or as a direct result of war. So that, I think, is a misleading argument. Well, those are all attempting to rebut arguments. But what about the positive case? I agree with John McCain, and for that matter, with Joe Biden, and even the way with Bernie Sanders. Never thought I'd say that. All of whom believe that to some degree, the world we have now is a world that we helped build with all of America's failures and limitations and mistakes. A world, parenthetically, in which we have become remarkably prosperous and lots of others, other people have too. A world in which some very basic notions of human freedom are accessible, if not always realized, by billions of people. And in which some basic norms of human conduct are out there, if not always respected. We, we created that. And the view I'm describing is, is basically the consensus view of American foreign policy I would argue throughout most of the Cold War, and even to some extent beyond. But that order is fragile. It always was fragile, and it always will be fragile. Ronald Reagan once said that liberty is always one generation away from extinction. And I think that's a powerful thought. The threats can come in many ways and from many different directions, and they do. When Benjamin Franklin was asked at the end of the Constitutional Convention, what kind of, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? His response was, a republic, if you can keep. The founders understood that the rights we take for granted, the system of government we take for granted, are fragile. And they understood, too, that the American experiment was always one of universal and not purely national significance. And that is why the greatest war in our history, waged purely by Americans against Americans, our greatest president described it as a test whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And Lincoln was right. More practically, only the United States has the combination of economic and military strength, influence and cultural attraction, alliance relationships, and national resilience to shape a world order in which our own liberal democracy can thrive, and that of others as well. To be clear, this is not a call for a crusading America, nor does it mean failing to recognize that American values and American interests occasionally are not synonymous and, in fact, conflict with each other. Resolving those conflicts is a test of statecraft. But absent the United States, there is real anarchy, not the anarchy described in classrooms by the so-called Realist School of International Relations, but the anarchic brutality of barrel bombs in Damascus and burning villages in Burma. Well, uh, what is the hand that the United States has with which it has to play in shaping the international order? The short answer is, in absolute terms, a very good one. In relative terms, though, a weakening one. There is nothing to beat the American alliance system. No other country in the world has ever had anything like the extraordinary range of agreements we have with the Europeans, with the Japanese, the Australians, more informally of late with Indi the Indians, but alliances are, as George Schultz, one of Reagan's Secretary of State, once said, like gardens. They need constant tending. The American military is the strongest on earth, but it is, in some respects, calcified, weakened as much as it has been strengthened by its vast experience of war. Less intellectually agile than it was, and seriously underfunded in ways that are manifested in pilots who've gotten about half as many flying hours as they need, ships deployed for 10 months at a time rather than six, army combat brigades that cannot be rated ready for war. The American economy is dynamic and still the most innovative on Earth and is aided by the plentiful supply of American energy and water resources. But it rests on an infrastructure of roads and railroads and airports that are increasingly inadequate and old. 
American demography is better than that of any other country in the world, most definitely including China. Our population is actually younger than the Chinese population. But for a time at least, the great, that great ability of the United States to integrate waves of aspiring newcomers to this country, as my grandparents were, is being challenged. American research institutions are superb, but freedom of thought and expression on our campuses is not what it once was. So the bottom line is that our hand is tremendously strong, and what is needed is hard work, statecraft, to make it work. What are the lessons of the last 15 years of war? I think one has to talk about that before one can talk about military power and its uses. Now, that's a very long topic, um, but I'll just make a couple of points. The first is the wars against Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Afghanistan look different to us who have lived through them than they will look to future historians. Take, for example, the Iraq War. Future historians may not date the origins of that war to 2002, they may not date it to 9-11. They may not even date it to the election of George W. Bush. They may date it to 1998, when the United States declared that the overthrow of Saddam Hussein was governmental policy. That was both, actually both the executive branch and the legislative branch in the Liberation of Iraq Act. They may date it to 1991, to the conclusion of the first Gulf War, or even earlier to the end of the Iran-Iraq War. Secondly, the wars that we have fought are connected in various ways, in particular because of the atmosphere after 9-11. My old boss, Condoleezza Rice, once said that every day after 9-11 felt like September 12th. But what you were afraid was that it's actually September 10th. I think that, that emotional atmosphere explains a lot of those wars. And as I'll discuss, these wars were bound to be long, but I think we can also begin to see now that they are part of a much larger crisis in the Middle East in which the United States is only one of the actors, not always the most important. Some bottom lines. I conclude that even though I was in favor of the Iraq War, that it was a mistake for a variety of reasons, some having to do with the conception of the war, but as much having to do with the institutions that conducted it. But like all wars, Iraq and the others as well were contingent events. Individuals mattered. Different decisions could have been taken. Um, I personally do not believe Iraq had to look the way Iraq looks today. Finally, I would say that it's important to study these wars and to reflect on them, but it's also important not to obsess about them. If we begin each discussion about future military engagements with shouts of Iraq, we'll make as big a mistake as people as those who took us into Vietnam with shouts of Munich. Well, what are the challenges to which military power is relevant? I would say there are four. China, the jihadi terrorist threat, what I call dangerous states, and ungoverned space for the great commons. China is clearly uh, on the rise. In Xi Jinping, we face the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. Uh, a leader who is ideological, very nationalistic, and very determined. China has a military budget somewhere between a third and a half that of the United States, and they actually spend their money pretty well. Uh, and with that, it can do a lot. It has claims to maritime possessions that would make a mockery of much of the international maritime order and a desire for a, a kind of hierarchical state order in Asia, which is the most economically dynamic part of the world, that harkens back to very old Chinese conceptions of what their role in the world would be. And that is not a vision that's good for the United States or good for China's neighbors, and I think ultimately not good for China. The jihadi terrorist threat, one of the mistakes we've made repeatedly is premature declarations of victory. This is happening right now as we speak, uh, with claims that the Islamic State has been defeated with the fall of the Syrian town of Raqqa. We may have taken that city, although it's, if you see the pictures on television, you see it's a rubble field. 
That doesn't mean that the Islamic State has gone away. Far from it. The Australian Chief of Army, General Peter Leahy, said um, a year ago that the war against jihadi movements is a hundred year war. I don't know that 100 years is the right number, but something like that, I suspect, is right. Dangerous states, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and there may be others. If China is the most formidable long-term challenge and the jihadis the immediate one, these are the most volatile ones. And at the moment, we're confronting all three. All three are regional powers seeking to assert themselves and who also feel hard done by, by the international system, and particularly by the United States. All three have or are seeking nuclear weapons and think that nuclear weapons are essential to their place in the world. All three have been willing to use force to destabilize their neighbors. All three are, moreover, locked in conflict with American allies and partners who look to the United States for leadership and reassurance. Finally, that phrase, the great commons, comes from Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great American naval theorist. And he was describing the ocean. He said, this is the great commons of mankind. Well, if we think about it, there are multiple versions of the great commons of humanity. There's the maritime domain, but there's outer space and indeed cyberspace. Those regions and ungoverned space as well, such as the Arctic and the Antarctic, are increasingly areas of great power of rivalry. It is in American interest and the interest of peace more generally to keep them out of the domains of international rivalry to the extent that we can. And on Earth, it is from ungoverned spaces, either actually lightly or chaotically governed places like Libya or large parts of Syria, that threats to global stability and security emerge. Now, none of these four sets of challenges is overwhelming. All of them are manageable. None of them are causes for you know, real hysteria, or accessible are, but there are two challenges. The first is that these areas of strategic challenge require not only different force structures, nuclear weapons, for example, are not going to help us deal with the jihadis, uh, and SEAL Team 6 or Delta have only a minor role to play in dealing with the Russians. So you need different kinds of forces, but more importantly, you need different ways of thinking about strategy, about the de development of military power, the deployment of it, and in some cases, its use. And it's very hard for individuals to be equally competent at more than one of those at a time. So that is a ma that's a major intellectual challenge as well as a material challenge for the United States. The second challenge is the problem of simultaneity. The United States uniquely does not get to focus on its most important strategic problems at its own pace. The United States does not get to ignore some while dealing with others. The question before American decision makers is always, what are we going to do? And it's the question that foreign leaders always ask you. I have vivid memory when I was serving the Bush administration, one of the advantages of being the counselors, you're always being invited over to ambassadors, residences for fancy lunches. Uh, the Europeans uh, usually had the nicest lunches, uh, but they were the ones who would be abusing the Bush administration most for all of our multiple sins. And uh, they'd be very polite about it, the food would be very good, but they would just be giving you unremitting grief. And I remember one in particular, I think the German ambassador, who was really, in a, a polite and erudite and pleasant way, was just really taking the Bush administration to task for everything. And then, as we concluded, he, he I forget which problem we were talking about, he said, so what are you going to do? And I said, you know, Mr. Ambassador, after listening to you for the last hour of this excellent lunch, I would assume you would want that we don't do anything. I mean, if you think we're they, such idiots, presumably you want us just to sit on our hands. He said, absolutely not. He said, you're the only ones that matter. And that's the problem. Those are the conversations American diplomats have. Finally, there's the question of the logic of hard power. A lot of the use of military power is not violent. A lot of it is about the potential use of military power, not actual use. And there are a lot of wars that have not happened because of American strength. But if we do indeed use military force, we have to ask ourselves how to think about it. Now, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, 
Ronald Reagan's uh, Secretary of uh, Defense, Casper Weinberger, laid out a series of rules for the use of force, which overtly or implicitly, many policymakers and certainly many military leaders have thought were right. And he laid out six principles in the speech in 1984. The United States should not commit force to combat unless the vital national interests of the United States and its allies are involved. U.S. troops should only be committed wholeheartedly with a clear intention of winning. U.S. troops should be committed only with clearly defined political and military objectives. The relationship between those objectives and the size and composition of the forces should be continually reassessed. U.S. troops should not be committed to battle without a reasonable assurance of the support of U.S. public opinion in Congress, and the commitment of U.S. troops is a last resort. And I would add the seventh and implied corollary, the politicians should give only broad guidance and then get out of the way. Well, unfortunately, the world does not work the way Weinberger wanted it to work. And I said, should only use force for vital interests? Well, then what was Grenada? For that matter, what was World War II? Why was World War II absolutely vital to American interests? We should go in wholeheartedly and with a clear intention to win. So if we're conducting counter-terrorist operations in Yemen, that implies that actually we should invade the country and take it over, which I don't think anybody wants. Is winning an unambiguous term? And as a military historian, I would say it's not. Clearly defined objectives and knowing precisely how we intend to win, well, that's not true of any war that I'm familiar with. Abraham Lincoln did not see how he was going to win the Civil War at the beginning. Franklin Roosevelt did not see exactly how we were going to win World War II. Reassessing the relationship between objectives and forces, that's fine, but you can paralyze yourself by, by doing that. Assuring yourself of public support in advance, the problem is public support is never guaranteed in advance. You have to fight for it. And finally, the idea that war is the last resort, well, as Carlton Clausewitz once pointed out, war is never the last resort. You can always give in. You can always do what the other side wants you to do. It's an intermediate resort. So I suggest that we need to think about both the realities as history teaches them, but also our own experiences for the last 15 years of war. And I'll give you my six rules as counterparts to Weinberger's. The first is understanding your war for what it is and not what you want it to be. That, I think, was our biggest mistake in Iraq. For too long, at the beginning of that war, uh, I personally heard senior government officials talk about bitter enders and former regime elements when actually what we were watching was the beginning of a Sunni-Shia civil war. And we didn't want to really acknowledge that. Secondly, although planning is important, being able to adapt is more important. Plans always go awry. As one German general once said, plan never survives contact with the enemy. We will never fight wars the way that we plan to. Thirdly, you may prefer to go short, you better be prepared to go long. The United States does have predilection for believing that it can finish wars quickly. That shaped our approach to the first Gulf War, which left unfinished business that haunted us for the next two decades. It was the short war obsession that led to President Bush's unfortunate mission accomplished moment, and indeed President Obama's belief that the killing of Osama bin Laden meant the beginning of the end for Al Qaeda which it did not. Fourth, I would say, while engaging in today's fight, prepare for tomorrow's challenge. Today's American military is remarkably combat experience. It's also disturbingly ill-prepared to confront Russia in Eastern Europe, and even, I would argue, to some extent, China in the South China Sea. Fifth, adroit strategy matters, but perseverance matters more. That may sound strange coming from a professor, but I think one of the mistakes that people sometimes make is thinking that what matters most is clever strategy. It doesn't. In, in war, unfortunately, it is perseverance and determination that matters most. And whatever else one may say about President Bush and about his conduct of the, the Iraq War, 
uh, I would say it was his perseverance and determination, particularly in the surge decision, that was most impressive. Finally, I would say a president can launch a war, but it's absolutely up to him or her to sustain it with congressional and popular support. So in other words, it's not something you guarantee in advance, it's something you have to fight for. And to that unwritten corollary of mine, I refer you to another book of mine, Supreme Command, there is no war that can simply be handed over to the military. Instead, it is what I call the different setting, an unequal dialogue between civilian and military leadership. Let me wrap up by saying that the book is fundamentally a book about strategic uncertainty. I think your generation is going to be facing a remarkably uncertain world. Um, my generation grew up with the Cold War, which sometimes looked pretty scary. I have vague childhood memories of the Cuban Missile Crisis, people filling bathtubs with water, doing those ridiculous drills for nuclear attack where you were hit under your desk, like that was going to do a lot of good. Uh, rations stored in the basement of uh, my elementary school. But at least it was kind of predictable. At least you knew who the opponent was. At least you knew what was at stake. At least you knew what they believed or what you believed. At least you knew where the front lines were. I think that's not going to be true for your generation. You're walking into a world of much greater uncertainty. The last thing I'll, I'll conclude with is uh, the paradox of the Obama administration. It's been my fate to be critical of most administrations. I suppose that's what professors are supposed to do. And I was critical of the Obama administration, uh, although not as critical as I've been of the Trump administration. But, but I gave and I give President Obama full credit for sincerity in believing in American retrenchment and pulling back in uh, the depth of his opposition to the Iraq War in his belief that the United States resorted way too much to the use of military power, uh, in his desire to focus, as he said, on nation building at home. And he acted in accordance with that. And those were some of the commitments that he made. His plan was to completely end our Afghan military commitment, for sure to terminate the Iraq commitment. And indeed, he and his vice president claimed that we, that we were done with Iraq. He believed that we finished off Al-Qaeda when we finished off Osama bin Laden. So what happened? He doubled down in Afghanistan and we went longer. And in fact, if anything, we're going to be upping our commitment there even more. He launched the third Iraq war in my lifetime because that's what it is. He got us into a war in Libya. He expanded by an order of magnitude the largest campaign of assassination, which I'm all in favor of, uh, in human history. He deployed U.S. Navy vessels provocatively close, as some would say, to Chinese man-made islands in the South China Sea. He deployed heavy armored forces to Europe for the first time since the end of the Cold War. And here's the great irony. If you know, when the tombstone is put up for the foreign policy of the Bush administration, there'll be a lot of things written on it, but at the top of that tombstone, in capital letters, will be the word Iraq. When the tombstone is put up for the foreign policy of the Obama administration, there'll be a lot of things put on that tombstone, and at the top of the tombstone, in capital letters, will be the word Syria. The one case where he made a threat and walked back from it and decided not to use force. I think what the Obama administration discovered, as I believe in some ways the Trump administration is discovering and reacting to as well, is the logic of America's global commitments and America's global presence. The nature of our choice, I think, is often going to be to engage belatedly, bloodily, and unsuccessfully, or prudently. And therefore, I would say that Teddy Roosevelt was right. All that we can do is settle whether we shall perform these duties well or ill. So let me stop there and take any questions or comments you might have.
I was I was listening to the pod Save the World podcast oh, yeah. that you had, and you said that Rex Tillerson might go down as the worst Secretary of State ever. And I'd like to see if you can unpack that in regards to the lack of political appointments that the Trump administration has made to the State Department, and also the tension and oversight that the White House has put on the State Department, and how that might delegitimize our, our American diplomacy. Yeah. So the, uh, the podcast was with Tommy Veter, who was the spokesman for the National Security Council staff in the Obama administration. And uh, much to uh, his dismay and mine, we got along actually very nicely. So uh, uh, it, was a, it was a very nice conversation on uh, God Save the World. Uh, I do think Tillerson is going to have one of the worst secretaries of state. You know, there have been plenty of other secretaries of state who have done foolish things and have had fights with the presidents that they served uh, and conducted stupid policies. But one of them that I'm aware of has also at the same time taken a pickaxe to his own department, which is what Secretary Tillerson has done. So to, first thing, to meet meekly, I, I, mean, I should make it very clear, he's clearly an honorable guy, a Boy Scout and all that, and I'm sure he was a fine leader of Exxon uh, But profoundly miscast in the role of the sec of Secretary of State. So let's just say one thing, cutting the State Department budget. The State Department is actually a pretty austerely funded institution. It's tiny, among other things. I mean, 50,000 employees worldwide say that's pretty big, but that's peanuts compared to the military. And it's actually very thinly stretched. 30% cut comes down from uh, the White House it's the job of the cabinet secretary when that sort of thing happens, not to salute smartly and say, yes, sir, but to fight like hell in every possible way you can to stop something that stupid. Because that really, that really is, well, that is slicing flesh and bone. It's not cutting fat. Um, it is extraordinary how few political point nominations he's made for key positions. We have one regional Assistant Secretary for Europe, that's the one for European Affairs. We don't have one for East Asia and Pacific. We don't have one for Near East. For Near East. But these are absolutely critical positions, which, because th these are the senior interlocutors that you have on the other side. These people spend most of their time on the road. They have kind of a view of the whole region, so they're more than just ambassadors. By the way, we're only now getting an ambassador to South Korea, although we do have one for the Bahamas. Um, not to fill these posts is malpractice. He's decided, as I'm sure many of you know, to travel without the principal, which is also insane, because part of the job of the Secretary of State is to explain American foreign policy to the world and to the American people. That's part of the job. And the way you do that is through the State Department Press Corps. And the State Department Press Corps, are, they are the, the most docile journalists in Washington, D.C. Because they're all the foreign policy junkies. So they're all graduates of SICE, places like SICE. And the reason why they're, they're covering the State Department beat is because they really get off on the details of NAFTA and you know, nuclear arms control agreements and stuff which send most journalists straight to sleep. They are easy to play, to be perfectly blunt about it. Uh, and you know, I remember in my own case, I traveled a lot with Secretary Rice. The plane is always filled with journalists. The Secretary always goes back to have an informal chat with them off the record. That's always been protected. And when she's not doing that, she's sending her minions, people like me, to continue the conversation so they understand sort of what you're up to. Because guess what? Then you get the favorable coverage. He's chosen not to do that. He has some sort of notion of completely reorganizing the State Department, bringing in Deloitte and I think there's one other consulting firm, which know from nothing about diplomacy. And you know they're basically planning on tearing the place down and building it up from the bottom. Well, maybe that's what you do at ExxonMobil. But it's not how you structure a government bureaucracy, as, as they will find out. And, and finally, he's kind of isolated himself from the department. So he has a chief of staff, he has the head of a policy planning staff, and that's it. 
Okay. Now, at ExxonMobil, you can give people pay raises and you can fire them. In the State Department, you can't really give them pay raises, and for sure, you can't really fire them. So what you better do is motivate. And a secretary does that by walking around, by having key political subordinates, who kind of get people moving in the right direction. And these people want to be, this is the thing that's particularly great about it, they want to be led. State Department is filled with lots of selfless, patriotic souls, want to go, just want to serve the country. They may be, you know, most of them probably didn't vote for Trump, I get that, but they didn't vote for Bush either. And you know what? We didn't have any trouble implementing Bush administration foreign policy. They, they want to serve, and they expect to serve different administrations during their careers. So that's why I think he's really been remarkably destructive. Uh, and again, it's not because he's a bad human being, it's just because he's profoundly miscast. And I do think he'd, they'd be better off if they got a politician, even somebody like Nikki Haley, who knows what it's like to run a government agency. For, for no other reason than, than that. And because they have some sense of what public affairs is all about. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what's your view on using like private military organizations? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm using uh, private military organizations as a tool for uh, contractors and so on. Like Blackwater. So I mean, this has been a, something of a change in the nature of uh, something of a nature. It's something of a change in the nature of the war as we wage it now. I used to go to Iraq and Afghanistan a lot. When I go to the base, the base is guarded by guys from Triple Canopy. When I go out to the boonies, I'd be uh, protected. There'd be one supervising State Department security officer and about six or seven highly muscular young men from Blackwater uh, who were armed to the teeth. Um, and who actually, by the way, did a pretty good job. But th that, is, that is a change. There, on the one hand, you know, contractors have always been around and it makes a certain amount of sense to do it. On the other hand, there's a problem. And actually, I think the problem might even be a little bit less on the military side than on the diplomatic side. So if you look at, for example, AID, which runs American Foreign Aid, in the old days, say, during Vietnam, AID officers are the ones who are going out into the villages and doing development projects. We had more AID officers deployed in Vietnam than in all of AID today. And instead, what we have is contractors. And what the AID officers do is they supervise contractors. And there are various companies that will do various projects. The problem with that is people who are in the employ of the federal government know that their job is to advance American foreign policy and serve American national interests. That's what they're supposed to do. Contractors are there to fulfill the contract. And it's not, it's not that they're, you know, I don't worry about most of them being uh, lazy or dishonest. Uh, but, but all of their incentives are in line simply, and their sense of mission is doing the project they were hired to do on time, on budget. And that actually causes some quite subtle problems. So I suspect, I hope that we'll be able to pull back to some extent from that, although I think actually it's going to be hard, and you'll see more privatization of things. Last thing on the military side, I, I, I guess my feeling is that although there will be a lot of contractors out there, there are a lot of contractors out there, when it comes to the delivery of lethal force, we're not going to let contractors do that. I think the institutions will resist that to the end, and, and should. If there's violence that's going to be delivered, it should be delivered by people in uniform or in some cases, uh, people working for CIA under a different set of authorities. Yeah. I'm trying to elicit your overall view of the consequences and the likely future of our involvement, speaking mystically, in Iraq. You said first that you would favor the war, then you now learned the mistake. Third, you said that you thought, however, Bush reached his team of terrorism. And he ordered the surge. Um, that implies to me that that's his peak of terrorism, that you are actually reasonably saying about the future of Iraq, as opposed to what many fear is the likelihood that Iraq is just going to be a satellite of Iran. Maybe we can save Kurdistan, but other than that, it's just part of that 
world of influence from Iran to Iraq to Syria to the Mediterranean. So I'm trying to get what your overall judgment so is. The bottom line is I have, a, I have a complicated view of Iraq. The fir first thing I'd like to emphasize is this business that wars are contingent events. And you know, if I have an objection to the Ken Burns series on Vietnam, it, it makes it look like you know, once you pull the lever, we're going to the rest of history is predetermined. And that's never the case. There are always twists and turns and decision points. Um, and it's, you know, when you live it, it's indeterminate. It's only historically it looks inevitable. Point one. Point two. You know, we don't know what the Iraq War prevented because it's important to remind ourselves in 2003 the inspections regime had broken down and the sanctions regime was breaking down too. So it would be Saddam out of his cage again. Well, that could have fled in a number of directions, uh, but none of, none of them really good. Um, thirdly, I think any, any administration, even the Gore administration, and somebody actually wrote a book to this effect, would have found itself under a lot of pressure to finish off the regime of Saddam. Uh, among other things, I'll just mention one thing which people have now completely forgotten. The sanctions regime, which we were holding together, soft power, uh, on Iraq, was extraordinarily unpopular in the Arab world. And in fact, if you look at some of Osama bin Laden's first documents, particularly the, uh, his declaration of uh, jihad against crusaders and Jews, being Jewish, I take personally, and Holy Cross, you should probably take the Crusaders part personally, too. Um, you know, he references the sufferings of the Iraqi people a lot, so you had that. Okay, so you have all that. Um, we go into Iraq, clearly the, the nuclear part of the intelligence was faulty. Uh, the administration did not emphasize the other arguments. And for sure, the administration and the military was not prepared for the challenges of military governance and all the rest. And I think the administration and the military together, I mean, the civilians are ultimately always responsible, but both can be faulted for not being ready for what was a challenge that could easily have been anticipated, and that's the challenge of governance. I also think, though, that um, it, the administration eventually got their act together, and I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Iraq, starting in 2004 was my first visit, and it changed a lot. By the end, in 2008, you could walk around Baghdad. You could see some kind of politics was emerging. Sunni, Shia, Kurds, all lubricated by oil. Um, was it great? No. Was it something we could live with? Yeah. Was it something that was a lot better than what they'd had before? No question about it. I do think the Obama administration blew it, um, in part because of Obama's decision to have nothing to do with Iraq. But I also think that keeping the Iranians at bay was always going to be a very, very difficult challenge, while reminding everybody that Arabs, Persians, do not always get along. And one of the first things the Iranians do is they begin assassinating some of the key Shia clerical figures in Iraq who were potential kind of Arab Shia sources of challenge to the religious authority of the Ayatollahs, uh, particularly a man named uh, Ayatollah Khoei, who, uh, and there's, there's also this large part of the sort of she has stuff here which has to do with the, the whether the religion where the, where the real religious centers of Shia Islam are in Iraq. They're not really in Iran. Uh, so there was a, there were other things were and I think at the end of the day we still don't know how this is all going to turn out. We just we don't we don't know. 50, 50. Your your prognosis is fifty fifty. In other words. Yeah, my my prognosis is I don't know. But but in retrospect, I mean, you never know what you're gonna know. So, I mean, it's a way pointless to say uh, I would have urged a somewhat different course, but it, it is what it is. It didn't have to be as bad as it is, that's for sure. That's for sure, I, I know. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with, the, with North Korea. Um, I wondered for a little while, on some level I understand, why America is 
so uh, existentially kind of concerned with North Korea developing a nuclear weapon. But um, what's always confused me is the focus on that considering the amount of damage that North Korea could do without a nuclear weapon. Like, so why are we, I don't ex exactly understand why we're so concerned that they might get a nuclear weapon that they might be able to fire with some accuracy when they already could like, as far as I understand it, do extremely serious damage to Seoul and to South Korea and to Japan, Tokyo, without sure. any nuclear weapons. Well, well, they have nuclear weapons, um, but, but I think the thing that is really driving acute worry is that uh, they're also developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. And uh, let's remember, ICBMs are a 50-plus-year-old technology. Um, plus, it, you know, it's never them just on their own. You know, there are they have Iranian connections. They have, there are, they have there were Pakistani connections. There are probably Rus some Russian connections there. In the past, there are certainly Chinese connections. So I think that the, the heart of this is that they'll have thermonuclear weapons that they can deliver on Los Angeles and ultimately on the United States, on, on New York and Washington, D.C. And even if it's not exquisitely accurate, you know, being, being in the vicinity of a, of a nuclear weapon that kind of missed is still really unpleasant. Um, there's the further, I think, so that's one dimension of it, that they can hit us. Uh, and they have actually threatened uh, some of the American statements. They're really pretty ferocious. Second fear that I think people reasonably have is proliferation. So I, one of my jobs when I was at State was uh, when the Secretary of State called me into her office and say, only two people know about this. I'm one, you're now the other. We think we found a North Korean nuclear reactor in Syria. That was in the spring of 2007. That, that was eventually resolved by the Israelis bombing that reactor, but it was a North Korean reactor. It was the same, it was, a, it was a identical copy of the Yongbyon reactor, which is where they generate their plutonium. And the North Koreans have sold, have sold and will sell anything to anybody. There's no inhibitions at all. So it is entirely conceivable that they would sell nuclear weapons to anybody. Uh, and that, I think, is terrifying. And then the third thing is, you're absolutely right about South Korea, but what this also allows them to do is really threaten Japan, which is nearby. And you know, one of the issue, long-standing issues in the United States government has always been, we, we don't want the Japanese to feel that they have to acquire nuclear weapons. That's why we want to be their nuclear guarantor, and we need for them to think that we're really reliable. If they no longer think we're reliable, and they're looking at North Korean nuclear weapons, between Japanese technology and Japanese stockpiles of plutonium, most people think they are a year away from a serious nuclear program. And what's a little bit unnerving is unofficial but senior Japanese are now much more willing to talk openly about a Japanese nuclear option than was every case in the past. And uh, you know, Japanese nuclear weapons, Chinese are not so keen on that, and, and there's a fear of a cascade of nuclear weapons. So that's, that, I think, is the, the, the concerns. The, what, what do you do about it? This administration came in the way every other administration came in saying, all of our predecessors were idiots. We know the solution. We'll get the Chinese to fix this. That's what the Obama administration said. Our predecessors were idiots. We know the solution. We'll get the Chinese to fix it. Bush administration said, our predecessors were idiots. We know the solution. We'll get the Chinese to fix it. Guess what? The Chinese have no interest in fixing it for us. And they never will, for a whole bunch of reasons I can go into. The North Koreans have no, no interest whatsoever in giving up their nuclear weapons. And the regime is not about to topple over, as far as we can tell, anytime soon. So that leaves you really with two possibilities. One is a preventive war, not preemptive, preventive. Preemptive is they're, you know, they're fueling up, and you're going to try to get them on the launch pad. Preventive is, you know, we just know someday you'll do something bad, so we're going to crush you now. Uh, or some combination of containment and deterrence, uh, and covert action to destabilize the regime and sanctions and, you know, some, and, and the threat of preemptive action, but, but a package which does not involve a preventive war. Uh, 
the problem that we've got is the president, uh, by the things he said, has and and his officials have basically echoed in different degrees is either they're going to get rid of the nuclear weapons and stop threatening us, or it's war. And that leaves only two outcomes. One outcome is our credibility is really shot because uh, this, is, this would be worse than the Obama red line that wasn't a red line in Lebanon because, and the reason why it's worse is because this is a threat that really is directed against us. And if you issue really blood curdling threats about something that's directed against you and you don't follow through, then you are simply a blow hard and nobody's going to take you seriously and that has real consequences. I think my view is Crimea is part of the price we paid for Lebanon, for the red line that wasn't a red line in Lebanon. I don't know what the next price you pay. Preventive war? Well, I'll just tell you what one of my friends who used to be the uh, Pacific Command war planner said the only way you can make sure that you get the nuclear weapons, which obviously you would really want to do, would be with American tactical nuclear weapons, you know, which you can dial down so the yield is only, you know, it's not 20 or 30 or 40 or 50,000 kilotons, it's a couple hundred tons of TNT. That is still, that is still enough to rattle your dentures. Um, Chinese would probably have strong views about the United States lighting off nuclear weapons on their southern border. Uh, it would be something of a precedent given that you know, the last time nuclear weapons were used in anger was us at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, there would be, no matter how you, the weapons are constructed, you're still talking about casualties, civilian casualties, and hundreds of thousands are talking about fallout. It's a god-awful mess. And that, for me, is the tragedy of the situation we're in. I, I don't see a third possibility of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically a glass half empty kind of guy, so <laughs> factor that one out. Yeah? So you said that the question of like, 60 answers should be I think, in particular cases, under certain circumstances, yes. And if I could break it down a little bit more, I'd say that in general, a, a, a strong United States with extensive alliances around the world is a force for peace and order and prosperity and a certain advance in, in human freedom. And in particular cases, depending on circumstances, use force. There, I, I don't really believe in doctrines um, or even in really in, in commitments unlike with the exception of treaty commitments. So we have a commitment under the North Atlantic Treaty under Article 5, an attack against one is an attack against all. We better be ready to follow through on those commitments. But in other cases the answer is it's all going to depend. And what kind of force and what ways is very circumstantial. Um, and that's, I think that's it's one of the hardest things to convey in a classroom, actually, because it's, you know, the ideas part of foreign policy is the easiest part, and, it, it, and it's certainly essential, but it's like 2% of what goes into the actual making of foreign policy. The rest is all particular circumstances, implementation, personalities, the flow of events, bureaucratic politics, all, the, all those other things. Yeah. Early on uh, in your talk, uh, one of the reasons that you cited for, for writing the book was that um, you were hoping to kind of bridge the gap that exists between the foreign policy people and defense people. And I was wondering, why, why do you think, where, where does that gap originate? Why does That's that exist? a very good question. I think part of it is, um, I suppose, two things. One had to do with the general unpopularity of military affairs and military history and that sort of thing after Vietnam. Um, plus, a general sense, well, the military is competent, they can handle these sorts of things, so civilians don't have to be particularly expert in them. So those things coming together that, you know, if, if uh, I mean, one of my favorite regions is about uh, universities not hiring military historians. You know, students love the courses. Um, but 
and that's basically an artifact of the post-Vietnam era. It has to do with trends in political science and trends in but above all trends in, in history. Uh, so you don't have as many people who are being educated and trained in it. And then particularly after the first Gulf War, well, you know, the military really looks like it's completely squared away and knows what it's doing, so it's not our problem. So that's one dimension. I think the other dimension of it is that um, you know, military affairs is a pretty technical kind of thing. And for a lot of civilians, it's fairly daunting. It requires a certain investment of time and learning the difference between a brigade and a battalion and having some rough idea of how a cruise missile works. Um, and a lot of people just are not interested in that. Whereas the people who are interested in that, you know, the ones who can tell you exactly how many rivets there are in an early Burke class destroyer, you know, they're not as interested in the personality of Vladimir Putin, or so that's, that's not going to be their thing. Or, you know, the history of treaty commitments and so on. So you're, you're, you're attracting different personality types. And although you know there are people who are at the intersection of those two, they're, they're different. They're different kinds of people. Okay. Um, what role would you say the peace through strength of the Reagan administration had on the fall of Soviet communism? Uh, first thing, by the way, I'd say about Reagan is uh, we are still living off the Reagan defense bill. Though. A friend of mine was, uh, was saying to me that uh, Donald Trump doesn't know this, but the worst thing he could do would be to have a big military parade down Pennsylvania Avenue the way he's talked about it, because all of our attaches would be say, yep, 1980s kid, yep, 1980s kid, yep, 1980s kid. M1 tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, F-16s, F-15s. This is, this is, we are still living off the Reagan, uh, there's other stuff there too, but we are still in, in some important ways living off the Reagan defense buildup. Secondly, I mean, the Reagan buildup was, was important, but I think it was, as a, and it's, but it's a great illustration of these things. It's, it changed the psychological equation. Because the Soviets in the 1970s would deep, deep in their own troubles, their own economic and social troubles, um, still thought the United States would really sliding downhill. And not just the Soviets, European experts, people like Raymond Aron, who knew the United States really well. And the United States pretty much passed. All of a sudden you have this president who's kind of a bullion and cheerful, and the United States is spending a lot of money on military things. And the Soviets also began to realize they're spending money on things that they can't possibly manage or duplicate. So I think one of the things that really, for example, somebody pointed out, if they had once upon a time, we had this thing called the F-117 stealth fighter. It was actually a bomber. And somebody pointed out, if they had been able to steal the design, they wouldn't be able to manufacture it because of the tolerances needed and clean rooms and all that sort of stuff would have been beyond them. And that, it really demoralized the Soviet leadership. And I think it did help open the way for things. But at the end of the day, you know, when it ended the Cold War, was Mikhail Gorbachev. I mean, I'll go back to what I said about contingency. It didn't have to end when it ended. Um, they got a very unusual leader who, luckily for the rest of us, made some really stupid mistakes. And he thought he could reform communism but keep it. And that was a, from the point of view of his system, a cataclysmic misjudgment. And to his credit, he was not willing to use violence to preserve it, which is enormously to his credit. Um, but it, the Cold War didn't have to end in the late 1980s, not by a long shot. It didn't have to end the way it did, I don't think. Should we take one last one? Or, sure. I'm, I'm in your hands. Uh, <laughs> we got one more question. Yep. I have a question about your idea of bridging uh, between... My, my idea of... The bridge that you're trying to create between the dichotomy, right, of uh, diplomacy and force. Yep. And just kind of how you're on opposite polar of the spectrum when you think about decision making, right? So in the military, you're using current intent, right? Kind of underwrite the decision subordinates when a lot of times when they see the civilian aspect of getting involved, how there's kind of a micromanaging. Yep. So like right now we see it in Afghanistan, there's a lot of media, so less federal damage. And then in Iraq and Syria, there's been, especially recently, more federal damage. 
Yep. Uh, so I think, I mean, for a lot of this, I'd refer you to uh, Supreme Command, which is really all about the nature of the, the dialogue. Uh, but I think my real point of departure is Clausewitz on the war. And, you know, what was, what was radical about Clausewitz's formulation, that war is the continuation of policy by other means, um, is he says, uh, what war, it's a continuation of policy by other means. It, it is not a mere act of policy, but a true political instrument. And in other words, what he's saying is war is suffused with politics, often in ways that people don't recognize. So it's not that there's a political decision to start a war and a political decision to end a war. But it's all political. And actually, insurgencies are the most political of all because you're competing for the loyalties of the population and, and so forth. So the United States has actually spent an enormous amount of time and effort to make its officer corps politically literate but not politicized, which is a very fine line if you think about it. On the whole, pretty successful. Um, I mean, so that's one reason why some people have concerns about how many generals there are in the administration. But you know, somebody like General Mick Nicholson, who's the commander in Afghanistan, is a very sophisticated guy. Um, who is very sensitive to both the, the Afghan domestic political situation and also to some extent the American domestic political situation and can understand constraints. Now, invariably, military leaders and civilian leaders will always have different perspectives and they should and want that. And that's why they have to have a... Uh, but the main thing I want to stress to you is politics does not stop during war time. It, it in no way Stops, and that's true of World War One and World War Two. Uh, whether it's managing allies or thinking about how you're going to deal with your opponent after the war, or negotiating a peace, or managing domestic politics of war, it's it is a thoroughly political enterprise. And I think human beings like clarity, so we like the idea that there are bright lines. And I've got my lane, and you've got your lane. And the United States government used to hold, if you say, no, I'm just sticking to my lane, that's a good thing. If somebody's out of their lane, that's a bad thing. But, but the truth is the nature of war is the lane, the barriers between the lanes are really very permeable. That, I mean, that's as much longer conversation we had. Yeah. Yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Professor.